to the let's go back to the cholesterol, the etiology of heart disease. Now, I've read Malcolm's book. I've interviewed Malcolm before. The Clot Thickens, wonderful book. I learned quite a bit about that, particularly the role stress had on there, which I didn't give enough credit to. But our cholesterol is maybe not the primary driver is heart disease, which most lipidologists would say it is. Most cardiologists adamantly will swear up and down that ApoB is is the necessary and sufficient driver of atherosclerotic disease. And we're going to do everything we can to suppress that. The new recommendations from the, I think the AHA, American Heart Association, American Diabetic Association, says they want diabetics to have an LDL below 70, which is about two, a factor of 38. So whatever that, divided by 38, 70 divided by 38 is 1.8 or something like that. And they want their, if they've had a family history, they want it below 50, it's like 1.2 or something like some ridiculously low numbers. So what say you to the folks that that are swearing up and down that ApoB, LDL cholesterol, whatever proxy for that is the prime driver, it's necessary and sufficient, and all we need to do is just bottom it out as low as possible? Nonsense. (laughs) Okay, fair enough. (laughs) But I suspect you probably want me to elaborate on that a little, Paul. I mean, that's just this horribly simplistic, and it really is... uh, the simple fact is that we've got very good prospective data now that demonstrates on average people with the highest LDL levels live the longest. How on God's green earth can ApoB be such a problem? So we need to go back to biochemistry a little bit. And first of all, ApoB is a really imprecise term mm. because... Multiple, multiple fragments, right? Yeah. Well, when we make cholesterol, how, where does LDL come from? First of all, we've got the liver. And just out of curiosity, I just, I've been browsing through this the other day, an old biochemistry textbook, and I was just thought, I wonder what they say about cholesterol synthesis. And they've actually got it absolutely correct. They just don't draw the conclusions correctly. But when you make, your liver makes something called VLDL, which is a large lipoprotein. And that is identified because it's got a single ApoB molecule on the surface. It's like a swipe card. Then that VLDL molecule goes through your circulation and it drops off some of its cargo because it's a, it's like a delivery truck. And some of that cargo includes triglycerides and cholesterol and it shrinks a little bit. And as it gets a bit smaller, we rename it. It's exactly the same particle, still got that same swipe card, the ApoB100 on the, in the membrane, but we call it an IDL, an intermediate density lipoprotein. Then it keeps, it finishes the delivery route, delivers a bit more cargo, gets a bit smaller, and then it's an LDL, low density lipoprotein. But it's still got that single molecule on it, still the same particle that was released by the liver, and then it gets taken back up by the liver. Now, the only reason it would not get taken back up by the liver is if that ApoB100 molecule was damaged. That's a swipe card that allows it to get back into the liver, that allows the liver to recognise it. And the things that would damage it include sugar damage, glycation damage, and oxidation damage, which you can get from seed oil. So having something like a donut, ice donut that's cooked in seed oil would be absolutely toxic. You get the sugar damage and oxidation damage all combined. You damage this ApoB100, this ApoB100 particle accumulates in the blood. But you also have to understand that the ApoB100 is found on the VLDL and the IDL. And we know we, we know that LDL levels are associated with longevity, but VLDL levels Interestingly enough, they're triglyceride rich. That's how we actually estimate how much triglycerides you have is look at the VLDL. The VLDL is associated with mortality, not longevity. So we've got one group of ApoB containing proteins that is associated with increased life, another group that's associated with reduced life, and somehow we're meant to know the relative contribution of each to the ApoB 100. So if you're looking at it like that, you say there's a bit of an information gap here. And if I could do something called an LDL subfraction, which we don't need to get into now, but it's just a more elaborate way of doing the test, we get that bit more information. Now, furthermore, we do know that the number of these ApoB particles, I said that if that swipe card is damaged, then the LDL can't get taken out of the circulation and it will essentially accumulate in your circulation. So you can end up with a whole lot of these LDL particles, which do contain ApoB100 on them, if you've got a lot of glycation and oxidation damage going on. So 
what that tells us is that if we do, and statistically speaking, having a lot of these, they're basically small, dense particles. If we have a lot of these accumulating in our blood, then that's suggestive that we're having too much sugar, having too much oxidation stress, whatever else. It might be what we're inhaling from pollution, what have you. It might be mold exposure, whatever, but there's something that's damaging our body and damaging our LDL. And the damaged LDL is associated with the problem, but not the healthy LDL. And that's the difference. If we're just measuring ApoB100, are we measuring the healthy ones? Are we measuring the unhealthy ones, damaged, undamaged? Are we measuring, do we know what's on LDL? Do we know what's on VLDL? This whole picture is just a little bit more complicated than these authorities who are telling us just to focus on one simple number are trying to make out, and better than that. Yeah, I tend to think of it as a dependent variable. Let's assume that 60% of your LDL is damaged. Well, then in that situation, a higher number is going to be problematic. But if only 2% of your LDL are damaged, you can have a pretty high number and it not be significant. I don't know if you saw the recent study out of Denmark. It was one of the, one of the registry studies where they looked at part of the MESA grouping and they saw that if someone had a CAC score of zero, LDL score was basically irrelevant when it came to MESA and cardiac events. There was no correlation. Didn't matter if it was LDL 190 plus, which is considered very high in, in the US numbers or very low. It had no bearing whatsoever. But so that showed to me that if you already have the environment, which perhaps damages LDL in place, then yes, it matters. But if it's not there, then perhaps it doesn't matter. Does that jive with what you have studied? Yeah, I mean, right? it's absolutely context dependent. Now, now, one thing to also note, though, is that this actually fits in very well with Malcolm Kendrick's theory of clotting. So basically, just to introduce it quickly, so the idea is that heart disease is actually caused by the tendency of the blood to form clots within it, what we call thromboses. And one of the driving factors of these thromboses is actually something called oxidation stress, which is like the tendency of iron to rust, that's oxidation. So if we have chemical instability in some of our tissues, they have this tendency to oxidize and that's damages them. And oxidation is the bad thing. Now, LDL can be oxidized. And guess what? That's circulating around our bloodstream. So if you've got a whole heap of oxidized LDL, that's creating a pro-coagulant tendency. That's increasing the likelihood that you're going to form these little clots or thrombi within your blood. And that is a direct and proximate cause of heart disease. Yeah. One of the things that I remember from reading his book is he said that the, that he could show that the cholesterol that was bound within the atherosclerotic plaque came from the red cell. There was a way to determine that, and that would go with the stasis argument or the thrombogenic potential, because red cells, when there's a blood clot, we have a bunch of red cells that aggregate, and then their cholesterol is somehow transferred into this new atherosclerotic plaque. Let's add a little bit. I can actually extend that story a little bit. Sure. So they stain for something, I think, called glycophorin, which is actually only found in red blood cells. So we can provide direct evidence that within the atherosclerotic plaque, there's remnants of red blood cells there. And we know that red blood cells one of the richest sources of cholesterol in the body is because the red blood cells are this funny shape. They have to be very flexible and malleable. And if they're not, they die. They get filtered out of the bloody pretty quickly. So they need a lot of cholesterol. Now, remember, we're talking about these plant sterols before, these the phytocholesterol and these kind of things, fake plant cholesterol. Now, red blood cells can also contain this and if anybody wants to do a quick internet search just log on to pubmed or whatever your google scholar whatever your favorite search method is and look for red blood cells and lifespan and vegetable oil seed oil oxidation what you'll see there's a bunch of literature that demonstrates that the more red blood cells take on these plant sterols the shorter their lifespan is, they become more fragile, they basically self-destruct. Mm. So number one, that tells us two things. Seed oil's bad. Number two, these fake plant cholesterols can actually get into the red blood cells. And what I, one of my suppositions that I posit in my lecture is that a lot of what we're seeing within the atherosclerotic plaque that we used to think was cholesterol 
is actually in actual fact not cholesterol, but it's actually the fake plant variant. And the reason is when we actually look at it under a microscope and you see these little clefts where we say, oh, that's a cholesterol cleft, you're not actually looking at cholesterol, you're looking at the space where the cholesterol used to be, where it's been dissolved after chemical treatment. And it's very difficult for us to distinguish between actual human cholesterol and the fake plant variety. And number two, for there to be a lot of cholesterol released into the to be free in the atherosclerotic plaques, it needs often needs to be released from these cells called macrophages. And we've got very good evidence that these macrophages, they don't want to let go of their cholesterol. They do a damn good job of holding on to it. But they don't like the fake version and they'll push that out and they'll expel it into their local environment. So, and further to this, if you remember back where we talked about these people with these disease cytosterolemia, who have these heart attacks in their 30s, when they die and they do biopsies of their big vessels like their aortas, they actually found that they've got plant sterols within their atherosclerotic deposit. So there's an impressive line of evidence now that would suggest that seed oils and plant sterols actually have more of a role in heart disease than we've previously understood. Now, just to upset a few people, because I, I couldn't do this without treading on a few toes, this includes coconut oil. So there's a study published in British Medical Journal where they got people to take, they supplemented them with olive oil, butter, and coconut oil that they used, it was something in the order of 94 or 96% saturated fat. So theoretically speaking, their cholesterol levels should have gone up through the roof. Their cholesterol levels actually dropped. Why is that? One, because saturated fat doesn't increase cholesterol. But two, as a seed oil, as a plant oil, it contains plant sterols and the plant sterols drive the cholesterol levels down. 